Millions are going to experience next week's total solar eclipse using their eyes and hopefully a pair of eclipse glasses. But what about those who have little to no vision? As Dave Schechter explains, the event is not something you have to just see to believe. There's so much stuff. It's so cool. Students across the country are super excited about the eclipse. At this school in Austin, they're even having an eclipse theme fair. Do you want to get a tattoo with me? Uh, sure. It's over to our left. But at the Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired, most of the kids like Yuki Hatch. Yeah, that one looks cool too. Won't be able to see much of the eclipse, but they're not going to let that stop them from being part of this historic event. What do you want to be in life? I want to be a computer scientist, computer programmer for NASA. I've always been interested in NASA, and then this year it really took off when I got to go to space camp. I want to make it possible for blind and visually impaired people to go to space. So everybody feel the sun on the front of your body? I'm going to be the moon. Stay right there. Matt, you're blocking the sun. There, I am blocking the sun. <laughs> That's right. Turns out if you dig science and you're creative, you can use all of your senses to experience an eclipse. Let's grab the, the power circuit. And do we know which one that is? That's what Jim Allen teaches his students. And there's your, there's your eclipse. And then the moon moves away and the light comes back out. Why do you feel like these students deserve access to the same science that everybody else has? Because it's not as easy for them to get it. Because they have the right. <laughs> <laughs> because they're a kid and we should do everything we can to make the information available to them in, in, in a, a manner in which they can access it and get meaning from it. In the U.S., there are about 55,000 school-age students who are legally blind. Unlike the kids in Austin who get specialized education, 85% are enrolled in mainstream schools. Teaching them science alongside sighted students requires resources and technology and a commitment which experts say can vary widely. Well, I'm super excited to be here. It's really nice to meet everyone. And I'm here today to kind of help you all build one of these devices. Allison Barilla is a Harvard astronomer. You ready? I think I can do that. The teachers and students in Austin are part of her national army of volunteers. Right there, beautiful. Helping produce hundreds of these boxes that she's co-designed that convert light into sound. It inspires a group that sometimes gets left out of those experiences. Well, can, you, can you kind of show me how it works? Okay, so I'm just gonna turn it on. So what we're hearing here right now is just the room. The light in my hand represents the sun, and as my hand goes up, the sun is fading. Allison's phone is like the moon, totally blocking out the light. So this would be totality. It's kind of eerie. Right. Is that what you were going I for? I mean, eclipses are eerie if yeah. you've ever experienced one. And then you start to come out, and you should hear... A little bit more, a little bit more. Allison has shipped her boxes to people across the path of the eclipse so they can hear the sun disappear behind the moon. Why do you think this issue of accessibility is important that, that people who are blind or visually impaired be included? They should get to experience it just like a sighted person gets to experience it. Can we both get an eclipse tattoo? With the help of technology, creative ideas, and teamwork, that's exactly what Yuki plans to do. It's really cool looking. During the eclipse and beyond. If someone said, hey, we have an accessible spaceship and we'd like you to go to space, I would literally say yes before they even could ask. <laughs> David Schechter joins us now from Dallas. Uh, David. Um, tell us more about how the Light Sound Project began and, and, and how it's expanding. Sure, John. So in, in 2017 was the last time we had this big eclipse, and Allison, the Harvard astronomer from the story, she was talking to a colleague who is a blind astronomer, astronomer um, uh, who's uh, sort of world-renowned, and we're talking about how she was taking light and converting it into sound for her work so she could process the information called sonification. And so she's like, yeah, that's a pretty good idea. So they started working on these boxes and they've, they've developed over time. They've gotten better to where they are now. And they just 
built 750 of them and shipped them off to people now in the path of totality. And they're hoping that they'll be able to ship them to the next place that's having an eclipse. And what other kinds of solutions are being uh, explored to overcome some of the other challenges that, that blind and visually impaired people face in, in the sciences and in, in space studies? Yeah, I th it's a great question. I'm thinking about Yuki, who was in the story, and she was telling me a story about it. She was in a mainstream school for a while, not the school that she's in currently, and they're learning about fingerprints, right? So they take out uh, scotch tape, the teacher puts it on their fingers, and they're supposed to look at it underneath the microscope. And all she could really do was hold the piece of scotch tape in her hand, did not get any of that science there. And so kind of getting to these places requires people like Allison or like Jim, the teacher in the story, who are thinking creatively about how to translate these lessons. And, but that's very uneven. So you have to have really a motivated teacher or somebody who's really pushing for this in order for these kids to get this kind of education. Great story. David Schechter, thank you so much. Thanks, John. Reminder, the total solar eclipse is set for Monday, April 8th. We'll have live coverage during the CBS special called Total Eclipse of the Heartland, beginning at 2 p.m. Eastern.